Hello again, as you know, I'm Eli the Computer Guy over here for EliTheComputerGuy.com and EveryManIT.com. Today's class is Digital Surveillance Cameras. So we just had a class, Introduction to Digital Surveillance Systems. In that class, we went over the overall concepts that you have to understand in order to understand how to work with or install digital surveillance systems. So we talked about things like cameras, but I didn't really give you any demonstration. You know, you saw what they looked like, but you did not actually see their capabilities. So today, I have a nice big 32 inch monitor right here. I will show you the actual capabilities of these uh, cameras so that you can see what they look like in the real world. Again, the important thing that you have to understand when you install digital surveillance systems is this is a very equipment heavy uh, type of technical profession. So, you know, with programming, programming is very time heavy. So if you make a mistake, all you've lost is time. You know, depending on how busy you are, that, that might be, you know, better or worse. Well, in the surveillance system industry, if you make a mistake on what cameras or systems you buy, not only do you not get paid for the work that you did, but you also could be sitting there with thousands upon thousands of dollars worth of equipment that you have nothing to do with. Again, as I talked about in the introduction to surveillance system class, a single megapixel camera can be $2,000 and you might not be able to return it. So if you purchase the wrong camera, you know, it's not a $20 mistake, it's not a $100 mistake, it's not a $500 mistake. It might be $2,000 per camera, uh, you know, a five camera system might mean if you made a mistake you're eating $10,000, which is not something that I would ever want to have to do. So. This class today, I'm going to show you the cameras. So when we're talking about digital surveillance systems, there's three overall parts to a surveillance system. The first part is cameras that we're talking about today. The second part is the command and control unit, basically the brains of the system, the digital video recorder or the network video recorder. This is where all the data goes back to from all the different cameras and that system does something with the data. It may broadcast it over the internet, it may record the information, it may set off some alarm or some, some robotic mechanism somewhere, but basically you have it like a command and control server and then you have the overall infrastructure that connects everything together. So you have cameras, you have command and control, and then you have the networking infrastructure, whether it's uh, just coax cable, whether it's Cat5 cable, etc. So we're going to go in depth today with the cameras themselves. So we're not going to be talking about recording video. We're not going to be talking about accessing the video from out online. All we're talking about today are the cameras. We're going to have another class on low command and control systems. Today is just the cameras. So you don't get confused and wonder what's going on. So with that, uh, give me a second. I, again, I'm Eli the Computer Guy. This class is Digital Surveillance uh, Cameras, and uh, let's dive right in. So as we talked about in the Introduction to Digital Surveillance System class, you have two overall types of cameras now. You have analog cameras and you have IP cameras. Now the important thing to understand is IP cameras and analog cameras basically look the same and use the same concepts. It is simply how they transmit data back to the command and control uh, unit uh, that is different. So with an old analog system, basically you have a coax cable that runs from the camera all the way straight connection back to the DVR or the digital video recorder. It's coax cable. So uh, the same stuff that you use for, for watching an old-fashioned TV uh, is what you use for the old analog um, video systems. With IP systems, you have the same basic camera, but it has a lot of brains, a lot of intelligence, and it sends the data back to that command and control unit using Ethernet and the TCP IP protocol. So basically what happens is the video goes into this thing and then depending on certain things it will then send the video back to the NVR, the network video recorder, to store the data or to do whatever the, the network video recorder will do. As we talked about before with analog cameras and IP cameras, IP cameras 
can have much better resolution than analog cameras. Analog cameras max out as something called 600 TVL or TV lines. TV lines are the horizontal lines on old fashioned cathode ray tube TVs uh, that basically says the resolution. So with an analog camera, the best resolution you're ever going to get is about DVD quality. And as I said before in the introduction to digital surveillance class, DVD quality sounds really good until you actually have to use it for a security application. And then you find out DVD quality is actually pretty darn bad. IP cameras, on the other hand, the sky is the limit on the resolution, on the quality. So this camera right here records in 1080p resolution. That means actual, honest by God, high definition. So, so if you're, 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 you're videotaping with this camera here, you are seeing a video quality that is actually better than, than, than what you're looking at right now. So if you downloaded an iTunes high definition movie, that is the quality that this thing records on. And you can get better than that. This is a five megapixel camera, uh, which records at 1080p resolution. I have seen 13 megapixel cameras and 20 megapixel cameras. This thing eh, costs about $2,000 installed. A 13 megapixel camera costs about $13,000 just for the camera itself. But depending on what you're doing, um, that's not necessarily a, a, a bad thing. So the important thing today, again, as we're talking about the cameras, we're going to be talking about low light cameras. We're going to be talking about infrared cameras. We're going to be talking about wide dynamic range and auto iris. Those concepts are the camera concepts. So it works on, on, uh, on IP cameras and it's the same on analog cameras. That part's the same. Infrared, low lux, no lux, auto iris, wide dynamic range are the same between analog and IP cameras. The difference between these two types of cameras is this one can have a better resolution than analog and it's how they send the data back to the servers that store the video recording and do other stuff with it. So that's the important thing to understand. Again, I will also hammer on you because I'm a professional and you guys are going out there to be professionals is remember with IP cameras is that they can, C-A-N, can be much, much better than the old analog cameras. They can also be much worse. It all depends upon the camera that you purchase. So this is a $2,000 camera. We talked about the $13,000 camera. I've seen $50,000 cameras out there. There's also $88 cameras. The $88 camera is about the quality of this thing. So that's, that's the important thing to realize. A lot of people think IP cameras are automatically better. And no, it's, it, it goes back to the specification. Um, if you buy a really high quality IP camera, it can be much better than the old analog cameras. If you buy a really low quality IP camera, well, it can suck. <laughs> but that's the important thing. Remember when we're dealing with cameras and we're talking today, again, infrared cameras, low lux cameras, the whole nine yards, these are things that are same between analog and IP. So let's talk about basic analog camera configuration. So right now we're talking about analog cameras, not IP cameras, analog cameras. Analog cameras have a straight run connection from the camera itself to the DVR or you can plug it directly into a television. So I have this camera right here and that through this little, little cable actually plugs directly into the TV in the back. So there is no brain power to this camera. So, uh, so it's kind of like if you, you were kids and you used a soup cans and you put a string in one soup can and it went to another and you used it for telephone. That's basically what the old analog uh, video cameras are like. You simply plug the wire in the back, you, you put it into a TV uh, or something that can read the video signal, and that's all you have to do. There's no intelligence, there's no IP configurations, there's no ARP or MAC addresses or any of that. You, you, you plug the cable into the back of this thing, you power it up, you plug it into a TV or DVR, uh, and you're done. So the cabling that you use for analog cameras, just so you know, is called RG59 cable. So this is a spool of it here. So you can, when you're doing large runs, you actually make your own cable. It's very easy. We're going to have a class on this uh, later. 
Again, that's more like the infrastructure class. This is the, uh, it's the, the camera class. This is called RG59 or Siamese cable. The reason is, is on one cable, you actually have two wires. This is the coax uh, cable. So this is the, the cable that's just like what plugs into your television. This here contains a positive and negative uh, power cable. So you are able to have your, your, your coax, your video cable, and your power cable all within one nice, neat little package. It's not the same wire. So this wire is used for the video. This wire is used for powering the camera, but they're connected to the same like plastic sheath or whatever, so that when you run this cable in, it makes life a lot easier. Um, because with a camera, you have to connect both the video connection and you have to be able to give it power. Uh, the, the coax cable does not give power onto itself. You have to plug in uh, one of these guys. You can use Cat5 cable in order to run um, analog uh, cameras. But the important thing to realize with that is that you're not using Cat5 cable for an Ethernet connection. You're using Cat5 cable basically as a substitute for this uh, RG59 um, coax cable. So don't, don't, don't quote me on the specifics, we'll get into it in the other class, but basically if you use Cat5 cable, you can do longer runs than if you use RG59. In general, you're always going to use RG59, but it's kind of one of those things that you should know. What you do is you buy a little device called a Balan, if you're going to be using Cat5 cable, it's called a balancer unbalancer, and that's what allows you to run the, audio, the, uh, the video signal over Cat5 cable. So remember, if you see analog systems, analog systems that use Cat5 cable, they're not transmitting video using IP. They're, they're transmitting video just, just like the, the analog system normally does. It's simply using Cat5 cable instead. So with these, you can buy prepackaged cables like the one I have plugged into this camera. The important thing, just so you guys understand, with any of these cables, is the connectors you generally use, I don't know if you can see this, but it looks like this. This is called a BNC connector, or a British Naval connector. Um, you know how in the electronics world, uh, everybody uses something slightly different to do the exact same thing, and there's no real reason why? Well, yeah, that's kind of like with the BNC connector. Like, why do they use BNC connectors instead of the standard connector that you would use uh, on coax for your cable TV? Um, I don't know. Why do they not use an RCA connector? I don't know. But there's just that's just what they do. Surveillance systems in general use these BNC connectors, British Naval connectors, like that. Well, if you want to plug your camera, like I have in over there, to a TV, so this is a TV I bought at Best Buy, well, TVs don't have BNC connectors on them, right? Well, what you can do is you can buy an adapter. So on here, I have a BNC to RCA adapter. That's how I'm showing you what's going on here. So I have a BNC connector on the cable. Then I take this BNC to RCA adapter, plug that in like so, and now I can run this from my video camera to the TV. So I want you to see that. Like, again, these connectors don't do anything with how the video is transmitted. You can use BNC, you can use uh, the, the coax, whatever the normal cable connector is. You can see use RCA, whatever you want to use. If for some reason you have a BNC connector and you need to connect it into a different type of analog port, you just use one of these adapters. They cost about a dollar. Literally all you do is you run over to Radio Shack, you go, ah! I need this kind of adapter, and they hand it to you, and that's a buck, or buck twenty-five. So, that's a thing, important thing to understand. So, what I'll do is I'll come over here, I plug in the BNC connector to the camera that we're playing with, and then run around to the other side of the TV, and plug it in to the video port in the back, and now we can see a video. See how simple that works? So like I say, there's no DVR in this, there's no intelligence. I plug the camera directly in um, to the television. Now one of the important things is we talked about power 
with, uh, with these video cameras. So with analog cameras, you have to be worried about what kind of adapter you use to power them. Uh, we're gonna have another class, we're gonna get into this, make it a little more sophisticated, but, for, but this is a very important concept that, that people overlook far too often, is that different cameras require different voltages and amperages in order to run. So again, I don't know why this is, they don't build all cameras with the same power requirements. Uh, they build cameras with different power requirements and different adapters give different powers. So when you're looking at it, this says input, so output. This says 12 volts DC, 600 milliamps. Well, I know the camera behind me requires 12 volts DC and 2,000 milliamps or two amps in order to run. If I used this adapter to try to power that camera, it would not turn on. But if I had a camera that only required, let's say, 500 milliamps to run, and I put in something that, that put out two amps, that would overpower the camera and it might actually end up destroying the camera. The important thing to realize, this is just a numbers thing. This is paint by numbers. You, you don't even really have to understand what I'm talking about. The important thing is you need to find for your camera what power it requires. It'll say 12 volts DC generally, and then it will say however many milliamps or amps. All you do is you find an adapter that gives that exact amount of power and you plug it in and you're fine. If you plug in a different adapter with a different amount of power, you may run into some very, very serious issues, including destroying the camera. It really does, it does happen. Basically, voltage is the speed electricity uh, moves through something. Amperage is the quantity uh, of what moves um, th through, through something. So basically, if you're looking at a, a big, slow-moving river, the river, all that water moving is the amperage. The slow speed of it is the voltage. If you look at a garden hose, the voltage may be high, it's shooting out water very quick, but the amperage is low, the actual quantity coming out of the hose is low. Again, actually we need to do an electronics class, so I'll do an electronics class to go over this more. The big thing, the big important thing, and I've seen many new technicians ravage cameras, is that they use the wrong power adapters. Make sure you get the right power adapter. Again, it is purely and utterly paint by numbers. It tells you the voltage, it tells you the milliamps. Make sure this equals what the camera needs and you're fine. If you use something else, well, uh, everything can go to hell. So, now that we've talked about that, one of the things that you have to realize uh, before you pull, you know, when you, when you go and you install a camera and you set it up and you, you mount it, before you pull the ladder down and go away, you should realize that there are configurations that you can set within the, some of these analog cameras. So some of the cameras you can't do anything about. Basically, you plug them, you, you put them on the wall, you, you, focus, you, know, you, you move them to where you want to move, and then you're done. There's, there's nothing to do. Well, with the more expensive analog cameras, there are configurations that you, you may need to play with and make sure that they're set up properly before you leave them. So a little camera like this, I can go, and there's a little set button on the bottom. If I press the set button, you will see here that I get a whole list of things that I can configure. I can configure, let's see, the lens, the shutter, um, that's a uh, auto iris that we're going to talk about in a minute, uh, white balance, backlight, DNR, a whole bunch of stuff. Basically, you're probably not going to have to remember this, the specifics of this, because, you know, this changes with every camera that you're going to use, but realize that there are configuration settings in here. There, there's, there can be a lot of different cool things you can do with a camera. Make sure you go in, and if it has options, that you play with it and see uh, what will happen. So with this guy right here, it has something called Auto Iris. We'll be talking about auto, auto Iris in one of the next sections. In order to make Auto Iris work, you have to go into that configuration and turn the Auto Iris config, uh, functionality on. If you don't, even though you paid $75 for Auto Iris functionality, the Auto Iris won't work because you did not turn the auto iris on.
See how that goes? So, so this stuff is, is pretty simple. Again, you just have to understand it. So the big thing is RG59 cables are what connect these uh, video cameras to systems or to the TVs. They use BNC, British Naval Connectors, are the actual connectors that connect the camera to the wire and then the camera to the DVR, digital video recorder. If you're plugging into something like a TV, you may use an adapter, like I'm using a BNC to RCA adapter to plug into this TV. Again, cost you buck twenty-five at Radio Shack. Remember, once you set this thing up, once you once you mount it on the wall, there are configurations that you may be able to set um, to make it do uh, whatever it does. So, you know, honestly, as I tell you, I've actually installed these things quite a few times, and there is nothing worse then when you mounted a camera 30 feet up in the air and you're all proud because it's aimed in the right direction blah 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 and you're done and you're about to get the check from the client and then you realize that one single camera doesn't look quite right because as I said uh, you forgot to turn auto iris on or <clears throat> I forgot to turn auto iris on so then you take the camera or you take the, uh, the ladder off the van you go over you get it up you climb up 30 feet you mess with the camera blah 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 blah. Everything would have been much better if, if you just remembered it to do it in the first place. So the big thing is remember with these cameras it's not really brain power. Like when we get to IP cameras, IP cameras have brains. They really do. They have intelligence. It's called pushing intelligence to the edge. It's, it's awesome. IP cameras have brains. Sometimes at least. These things don't really have brains. They have configurations. You just have to make sure you go in and set the configurations properly for whatever it is you want to do. And again, just like DVD players, just like TVs, every camera, even if it has configurations, the, the setup will look different. You know, it'll have, you'll have to press left for some things and right for other things. The main thing to remember is that it has configurations and that you should go in there and, and, and play with it. So that's the basic configurations for, uh, for digital surveillance, for analog digital surveillance cameras. So now let's talk about the basic form factors of these cameras. So the form factor is basically what the camera looks like once it gets installed on the wall. The specifications for the cameras that are inside these different form factors can be the exact same. So this can be the exact same quality as this, it's just a different form for, for what you're going to be using it for. So this is the old classic dome camera. So basically you have a camera inside a dome. So if I open this up, you'll see in here is a camera. So that is a camera. Why people use the dome form factor camera is because you, you screw it on the wall, you aim it to where you want it to look, and then you screw the dome on. Why this is important is now people can't tamper with where this camera looks. So as long as you screw it into the wall very tightly, um, it's always going to be looking in the exact same direction. So it's, you know, it can't be moved. If somebody tries to tamper with it, well, it's got a dome on top, obviously. Well, then you have what are called the bullet cameras. Bullet cameras are de generally, you know, cigar shaped, log shaped, whatever you want to call this, cameras that are connected to a mounting that's connected to them, that screw onto the wall, and then are very easy for you to, to, uh, to, to move around as you see fit. The good part about these are they're very easy to install. Again, you just screw them into the wall, and then you point them where you want them pointed, and then you walk away. You don't have any domes to worry about, you don't have any special screws, any of that. The issue is if somebody comes along with a little stick, or if this is low enough, they can just push it to look into a different direction. So if this is looking at your cash register and the criminal comes in and knocks it, so that's now not looking at your cash register, well now he can rob you and the camera is still recording, the, 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 but instead of recording him robbing the store, it's now recording um, the, the, the potato chip bags or something. So that's the thing with bullet cameras. So bullet cameras are these log cameras that are connected to a mounting bracket that easily get screwed into the wall and then you can move around and aim them very easily, very quickly. Problem again is, you know, 
it's very easy to tamper with one of these things. You'll notice there's a size difference between these two. This is a bullet camera and this is a bullet camera. The difference is, is the, the specifications of what these cameras do. This camera here is good for the inside um, in normal light conditions. So in the lighting that I have here, this camera will work fine. This camera is, can be used outside in sub-zero rainy weather, snowy, sleety, the whole nine yards, got a nice case, and it has infrared lights in it. So in complete darkness, it can turn on these infrared lights and see in, in, with it when there's zero light. We'll talk about infrared cameras in a little bit. But these are still both considered uh, bullet cameras. Then, you have the traditional box camera. So these are the cameras that, that most people think of when they think of surveillance cameras. So this is the IP camera I've been showing you. Um, this is just a normal analog uh, box camera. The important thing to understand, especially when you're buying box cameras, is when you buy a box camera, all you're getting is the camera. You're not getting the lens and you're not getting the mount. So when you buy this box camera from this particular vendor, you'll spend about 200 bucks for this. And then it's still not useful because you need to install a lens on it so that it can actually see something and you need to buy a mount so you can screw it to the wall. That lens is going to cost you at least 50 bucks, uh, maybe as much as $150, and the mount's going to cost you somewhere between $10 to $20. So this $200 camera can very easily get up to $350, $400 your cost um, without you realizing it's going to cost that. So if you're going to be using box cameras, the big thing to understand um, is that you know when you're pricing this out for your client, you make sure to include the lens and you make sure to include uh, the mount. The other big thing is that you purchase the right lens for your box camera. So the nice part with, with uh, dome cameras and with bullet cameras, the other cameras that I'm showing you, is the lens is already built in. So it's kind of a general all-purpose lens. Uh, it's very good. Well, with, with these guys, you can get telephoto lenses, so you can, you can put this on a building and then zoom in on something half a mile away, um, but that's not going to be good if you have a convenience store. You can buy wide-angle lenses, so like in a convenience store, you can see the entire store from one little camera. That's going to be great in a convenience store. It won't be great in, in other situations. So the thing to remember, if you buy box cameras, you can put different lenses on. Those different lenses are going to allow the camera to, to, to view in different ways that, that may be you know, better or worse uh, for what you're doing. But that's the box camera. The next kind of camera, that's a standard camera, is one of these, these neat, mean bad boys. Looks like it should be in you know Transformers or something. This is called a Vandal Proof Dome Camera. So this is a very high quality, this particular one is very high quality. I don't know if you can see the little camera in there. But um, the important part with this is not only is it a tamper-proof dome, but you can hit this thing with a sledgehammer and you're not going to break this. So this is very good for situations like right now in like Athens or you know in Afghanistan or something like that. If you're worried that somebody is going to try to shoot your camera, uh, if you're worried somebody's going to throw rocks at your camera, if you're worried somebody's going to take a baseball bat to your camera, these vandal-proof dome cameras are very good. This is a this is a hardened aluminum frame. Um, the vandal-proof dome is you know very very hard plexiglass, so this can take a large amount of abuse, and the camera inside will will still be fine. You might you might have to replace the housing, um, but the camera inside should be fine and should keep recording. The important thing I always warn people with these vandal-proof domes is that. You have to mount these to something. So you have to mount these into a wall, you have to mount these into a pole. And so although you can't damage the camera itself, if you don't mount this securely, somebody can still knock it off the wall um, and then it doesn't do you any good. So with Vandal Proof Domes, normally when I do uh, install these, I normally install them like 20 feet up. So, you know, somebody may be able, to be, be able to throw a rock at it, which will be fine, but somebody wouldn't be able to hit with a baseball bat or, or, or try to really like jump on it and hang on it and try to bring it down. So the important thing to remember with these Vandal Proof Dome cameras, very, very strong, very, very rugged, can, can resist a lot of stuff, the, the, the camera and the housing itself, but if you don't mount it worth a darn, well, then, then people can still smack it off the wall. 
doesn't really help you. Then the final type of camera is, as we've talked about before, uh, that I hate, at least in the analog world, is PTZ cameras. So PTZ cameras are the robotic cameras that you see in, in movies like Mission Impossible, where it goes, wah, 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 and it like focuses in uh, on the bad guy doing something bad. Um, pan, tilt, zoom, PTZ cameras refer to the functions they do. So pan means that it can turn left or right, tilt, means that it, it can turn the camera you know, up or down, and then zoom means it can zoom in or out on whatever it is looking at. So that is pan, tilt, zoom cameras. If you're dealing with analog cameras, the important thing to remember is that not only do you have the BNC connector to connect it to your system, not only do you have the power connector to give it power, but you also have controller wires. So these controller wires are what control the robotic action of the camera. So you can sit down at your DVR, your digital video recorder, and use the keyboard to, to move the camera around, left, right, up, down, etc. That is done because there's a little controller card installed on your digital video recorder, and that wire runs all the way to the controller cables on this PTZ. So that is something important to remember with, with these guys, is not only do you need the video connector, not only do you need the power connector, but you also need the controller connector. As we talked about in the last class, these PTZ cameras use a protocol to communicate with each other and back to the DVR, the digital video recorder. There are a lot of different protocols out there and you have to make sure that the protocol your PTZ camera is set for is the same protocol your DVR is set to talk in. So again, this is one of those, just like the connectors we talked about, there's 20 different protocols for no good reason. <laughs> they all do the same thing. They all make the cameras go left, they all make the cameras go right, up, down. But there's 20 different protocols out there. The, the standard protocols are generally Pelco D or Pelco P. The important thing, like I say, I hate PTZ cameras with a passion. I'm not going to do a class on PTZ cameras because I hate them so much, at least in the analog world. But the important thing to remember is that the PTZ protocol you set the camera to use is the same one that you set the DVR to use. If you buy a camera that uses a protocol your DVR, your digital video recorder, doesn't understand, then they're not going to be able to talk ever, 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 ever. With PTZs, the only time I like them is if you are talking about the IP world. So if you have IP PTZ cameras, those are very nice to use. The reason is, is because you plug them into the network just like you would a normal IP camera and then you configure them just like you any, would any other network resource on the network. These things are horrible and evil and nasty. Analog PTZ cameras are not worth the time. I would rather install four normal cameras than one PTZ camera. They're absolutely evil. But if you have an IP PTZ camera, uh, it's not too too bad. So the important thing to remember with all these is that we have different form factors. The cameras inside are the same. So the camera inside this uh, vandal proof dome is literally the same camera that is inside this box uh, camera, except this one needs a lens, is the same camera that's inside uh, this bullet camera. So they all have basically the same cameras inside. It's a different form factor. Now one thing I didn't talk about is that some of these cameras are built to be outside in harsh weather, like I was saying with this bullet camera. So if you have this box camera, you cannot put this outside. If you put this outside as it is with a lens on it uh, and it rains, it's going to die. Just like if you put your, your DVD player out in the rain. It's, it's not going to work. It's not built to be out in the weather. This bullet camera is and so what they do to make it so this can be out in the weather is this has a very robust weatherproof housing. So I don't know if you guys can see this, but I pull this off. So this is a very strong housing to protect the camera inside. It's got high quality O-rings to seal the connection, etc. So if you need to put cameras outside of a building or in a warehouse, make sure they're rated to be outside cameras. These cameras are going to be built much better uh, than the cameras used inside. Because obviously, you know, if you have a camera inside a convenience store, it's always going to be about 75 degrees. It's never going to get rained on, etc. 
Well, if you put a camera out in a, in, in, in a, uh, in a parking lot, it's going to get rained on, snowed on, sleeted on, etc. So this will cost you more money, but it's going to be built to, to, to go outside. One of these outside cameras generally lasts, I don't know, five to eight years um, out in the elements. Uh, and like I say, really nasty, like Maryland elements getting blizzard on and all that. Whereas, you know, one of these normal cameras, if you put that box camera out in the rain, it's going to last all of about 20 minutes. But those are the basic form factors for digital surveillance cameras. And again, these form factors are basically the same whether you're dealing with analog cameras or IP cameras. There's, there's IP box cameras and analog box cameras. There's IP bullet cameras and analog IP cameras. And domes, etc. So we've talked about the forms of the cameras. We've talked about dome cameras and, bo and uh, box cameras and, and bullet cameras, etc. Now let's talk about the capabilities of the cameras themselves, because obviously cameras, you know, can see video. But what else can they do? What makes them special? Well, the big thing that makes cameras special is the ability to see in different lighting conditions. So the big concepts that you should understand are low light cameras, no light cameras, auto iris lenses, and wide dynamic range. I'm going to show you practically what these cameras do and why it's important. So the first uh, type of camera is a low light camera. This is very good to use in situations that will many times be dark. So imagine a convenience store, let's say it's only open till 11 o'clock tonight, and you're worried that somebody may break in during the night. Now, you don't want to leave your lights on all the time, but you do want to be able to record if somebody breaks in and steals a cash register. Well, you can use a low light camera. The important thing with a low light camera is it can see in very, very low uh, light environments. So, uh, so simply the exit sign that's already lit up anyway can give off enough light so that the camera can see. Whenever you're talking about low light cameras, you're going to be talking about something called LUX, L-U-X. LUX is a measurement of visible light. So 32,000 LUX is sunlight. If you walk out on a bright sunny day, 32,000 LUX is the amount of light that you're seeing. One LUX is the amount of light that is given from the moon, don't ask me why, at tropical latitudes. So if you go down like to the Bahamas and you go out on a night that has a full moon, that amount of light is one lux. 0 0.002 lux is a moonless night with air glow. So basically if you walk out into a moonless night but there's still enough light for some bizarre reason that you kind of can see what's going on. You know, that's normally the light that they use in weird horror movies. That's 0 .002 lux. So I'm going to show you why having a 0 .002 lux camera is very cool. So this box camera that I have here is a 0 .002 lux camera. So as you can see, I've just got it pointed off, you know, that way. So if you can look, it's just pointed at the shelving or whatever that's over here. Right now, I have, you know, the big bright lights on. Um, and obviously, you can see me. You can see this. You know, you can see everything fine. Um, there is some light coming in from the outside world. The reason is, is because I have not renovated my little studio down here. So there's actually kind of holes in the wall. So you do get a little bit of light in. But right now, it's about 5 o'clock at night. So the sun's going down outside, there's only a very bit, a little bit of light coming in, and I'm going to turn off the only lights that are on, on in here. So I'm going to turn off both of my, uh, my studio lights, and you can see what this camera can see. So right now this camera, you know, if you look at the camera, you can see, you know, you can see me. Hi! Right? And this is normal light. Well, well here, let, let's look at something cool. So the first thing, I'm going to turn off my first light. And then, okay, it's dimmer. Yeah, no big deal. Now I'm going to turn off the second light. And now you can see it's really darn dark in here. Like, oops, I'm really kind of having trouble uh, moving. And now look at that. See how the camera adjusts? So in this lighting condition, look. So <laughs> I'm talking to this camera to talk 
through here to you. So my video recorder that's, that's recording this class is seen in the normal spectrum that a human could see. And you can't, you can't see me, right? See, look. You can't see me at all. Well, this camera, with the amount of light given off uh, by, by the LCD screen and the little bit that comes in, can see me. So this is a .002 Lux camera. So if you can see, the .002 Lux camera can still see in color in very low light conditions. And obviously, you know, can see what's going on in, in low light. Uh, is a lot more pixelated than it normally would be. But, you know, it's still pretty good. You can still see that I have a worn shirt on. You can still see I have a beard. You can even still see, uh, sort of, the little smiling computer face in the background. So this is what is called a low lux camera. It still requires visible light in order to see, um, but it doesn't need very much visible light. So that is a low lux camera. Now I'll turn this back on. And we go back into the world of the lighted. So that is what a low lux camera is, and that's why it's considered so cool. So in as little light as there was in here, this camera could see, still see. A normal camera, this LCD screen would have been black because it wouldn't have been able to see anything. Now the next type of low light camera is a no light camera. These are infrared cameras. So with these cameras, um, like this bullet camera that I showed you before, it has basically infrared flashlights built into the camera itself. When the light goes below a certain level, those infrared lights kick on, and then it is able to see in the infrared spectrum. So, I have the bullet camera that I was showing you earlier has these infrared lights uh, built into it. So I don't know, can't really see it, it's already plugged in. But basically, it has infrared lights around the camera inside the dome. So if I plug this into here, you will see that, yeah, see it's a dome camera. Oops. And, you know, you can look around and then see the rest of, you know, what's going on here. Now with this, if I turn off the lights, like I did before, oops, it's kind of rolling around. Let me run over here, let me turn off the lights. You can now see that it uses the flashlight, the infrared flashlight, to see me. So, unlike the low lux camera, this camera can see in complete darkness, but the difference is, if you'll notice, it's black and white. Why? Because it is looking in the infrared spectrum. Now, the important thing to realize with these infrared cameras is that they are very good because they can see in absolute black conditions. The problem is, since it's using this flashlight, I don't know if you can see this, it washes out a lot of the features of somebody's face uh, when, it's, when somebody's face goes by the video camera. So with this, it's one bright equivalent of a white light, and you can see that I have a beard, but you really can't see a lot of my facial uh, features because it all gets bled out because there is so much light coming off this little infrared lens. So the good part with infrared cameras is that they can see in complete darkness, but you can't see color. And like I say, it, it can make it so, uh, so all, the, all the features of somebody kind of, kind of bleed out. So this is a no light camera. Like I say, you can put this in your basement. Um, you know, I don't know, you can put it in a sewer, you can put it anywhere that there's absolutely no light and see all the little rats and alligators and, and all that kind of stuff running around. So that is a no light camera. That's a no light camera. Now the final thing that I'll actually show you is what is called auto iris. So we plug in back to the box camera that I was using before, the low light box camera. What Auto Iris does is Auto Iris automatically closes or, or makes the shutter in the lens of a camera smaller so not as much light can come in. The reason for this is many times you can put a camera where lighting conditions change throughout the day. So we showed, or I just showed you how lighting can become dark. So you want to see, you know, in the darkness. 
Well, a lot of times you may have to position the camera where at a certain point in the day the sun is shining in or there's a bright light directed at it and it has to adjust so it can see anything because if the lens remains the same size if that shutter remains open it's going to absorb all that light but it won't it everything kind of bleeds out like i showed you with that that infrared uh, thing so with auto iris what happens is the iris automatically gets smaller so that less light gets in so that you can still see what's going on the easiest way to show you this is again, the, the lighting I use here is, is 500 watt uh, lights. So what I can do is I can take my little, little camera with the auto iris lens and I can point it directly at the camera or at the, uh, oh, at the light bulbs. And if you notice, it now has closed the iris so that it can see things better. So, you know, this light was this, just this huge big ball and you really couldn't see um, a lot of the detail that you can now see. Once I pointed this camera at that bright light, it closed the iris and now it can see a lot of detail better. So, uh, so there you go. That's all auto iris does. Basically, it just closes the iris so that less light gets in so that the camera can still see what's going on. If you point a camera Again, at the sunlight, or if there's a lot of light reflecting in, if it doesn't close that iris, everything is just going to bleed out. All you're going to see is a whole bunch of light. Um, you know, it's going to look like something out of one of those religious movies where you have people like walking across the light and they're all kind of wavy and stuff. So, again, you'll see a big wavy religious blob robbing you, but you won't really know who it was. Having the auto iris closes the iris, less light comes in, and then you'll be able to see the detail of what's going on. The final type of camera is, uh, or the type of functionality is something called wide dynamic range. I don't actually have a camera that's capable of wide dynamic range. All wide dynamic range means is that the camera can see in more lighting conditions better. Um, basically all the way from bright sunlight into darker conditions. That's all wide dynamic range is. If you have the option of buying a camera with wide dynamic range or without, buy it with. It is a very good feature. Again, it just allows um, the, the camera to see in a wider range uh, of lighting conditions, and that's all it is. It'll probably run you an extra few bucks uh, with your cameras. I would have one, but I already have all these, these cameras, and I don't want to buy any, any new ones. So I just showed you how these camera functionality works. I showed you low lux. So lux is a measurement of sunlight. Uh, 32,000 lux is full sunlight. One lux is the full moon at tropical latitudes. I don't know why, but it is. 0 0.002 lux, which is what my box camera is, is a moonless night with air glow. As I, as I showed you, I turned off the lights. You could still see what's going on. You could still even see the color of my shirt just from, from the ambient light in here. Then showed you the no light cameras. The no light cameras use infrared, basically flashlights, to be able to light up the area. They are very good. But when they do go to the black and the, uh, the the night setting, they are black and white. And if the, those those uh, infrared flashlights are too close to a face going by, they can bleed out a lot of the features of the face. So you have to be careful. Again, you see a big white blob running by. Yeah, that, that's all you see. You know, the big white blob uh, stole your cash register. Again, that doesn't really help anybody. Then I showed you auto iris. This is an important one where again, if light comes into an area during certain parts of the day, the iris on the lens may have to close down in order for less light to come in for you to be able to see everything better. Then the final thing was wide dynamic range. Again, basically all wide dynamic range means is that you can see in more lighting conditions. I don't have a camera that does it. Basically, just if you're gonna buy a camera, buy one with a built-in. Basically, all it is is a better camera. But those are the basic types of functionality for cameras. So now that you've seen the form factors of the cameras and you see the type of cameras, you know, low light cameras, no light cameras, I want to take you over to a website and show you how you can look at the specifications of cameras when you're going to buy cameras. The big thing to remember with surveillance cameras is there's just a bazillion different types of cameras out there. Um, a lot of different types of cameras will do the exact same job uh, fairly well, but you have to make sure you buy the right type of camera 
for the job that you're going to be doing. Um, literally, there's probably 5,000 different variations of cameras out there. So when you're going to look at the specifications, you have to make sure you buy the right type of camera. If a, if a client wants a low light camera and you buy an infrared no light camera, uh, that may kill the deal. Um, just you know, if you if you buy a box camera without the lens, uh, then you could lose a lot of money. Um, you know, you you could need to buy an extra thousand or two thousand dollars worth of parts, which means your profit margin goes from being really incredibly good uh, to why the hell did I take this job? So it's very important that you buy the proper parts. So let's go over to the computer, and again, I'll just take a couple of seconds and show you how you can look at the specifications of these cameras to make sure you're buying the right ones for what you need. So here we are at supercircuits.com. Like I talked about in the introduction to digital surveillance systems class, supercircuits.com is kind of like the one-stop shop to go to if you need surveillance equipment. Uh, just like if you want to build a computer, you will probably go to newegg.com if you're going to buy a build a digital surveillance system, you just go to supercircuits.com. They have the cabling, they have the power supplies, they have a bazillion different cameras, they have most of what you need. Once you get more professional, you know, if you start uh, trying to install 10 or 20 systems in a year, you may want to go and find a different vendor that might give you a better price or more personal service. But if you're only looking to install you know, three systems a year, maybe up to 10 systems a year, or if you're just playing around with this, just go to Super Circuits. All their stuff is fine. You know, as I say, it's, it's, it's good enough. It'll, it'll, it'll do you well. But I want to show you all the different cameras that you can buy so that you have this in mind when you go to buy cameras uh, for your system. So with Super Circuits, we can just go to Products. They have different levels of equipment. We're going to go to Business Security. They have Law Enforcement. You can also, if you become a dealer, they will give you some, some better options, you know, some better shipping and prices and all that. Um, but right now, we'll just go to Business Security. And now you can see they have IP cameras, they have all kinds of different widgets, they have hidden cameras and, and clocks, you know, every, everything in the world. I mean, if you, if you just want to be a little James Bond person for a few minutes, you can go in here and you can see all the cool stuff. On the left-hand side, you'll see they have security cameras, hidden cameras. One thing I will say is I would suggest that you don't use hidden cameras unless you really 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 know what you're doing the reason is is because you could run into legal situations if you use hidden cameras and for some reason it's illegal in the uh, whatever place you're at so sometimes like I say you're not able to videotape people without their approval so if you put a hidden camera in somewhere and then somebody says that you're violating their rights you could end up getting sued because you put in a camera that was trying to protect you. The other thing is, is remember, criminals will not be deterred by what they don't see. So if you get a really small camera, or if you get a hidden camera, the criminal is not going to see it, and so they're going to still end up robbing you. So I would prefer, you know, not get robbed, than get robbed and have it on tape, if you know what I'm saying. So using hidden cameras, they have them, I would highly suggest you don't use them. So we'll just go up to the standard security cameras, and here you'll see that there's all different types. Fixed security cameras, bullet cameras like we talked about, infrared, dome, IP, etc. So we can go on to like the bullet cameras. And then they have lots of different options here. So super high resolution water weatherproof color camera. So let's look. 550 lines of resolution at a 0.2 lux low light rating. So this can see in slightly less than, than, than moonlight. Uh, 92 degree field of view, super compact. It's $119. Now if we go down, you'll see this super wide angle lens doesn't say it's weatherproof, only has 470 lines, has 0.5 lux, so it can't see in, in as dark conditions. It has a 170 degree field of view, which means it can see in a much, much wider angle. That's $139. Now we go down here, super low light weatherproof security camera, 420 lines resolution, so that's less than this 550 lines, so the, the, the quality of the video is going to be less, 
but it's a 0 .0003 lux camera. So this is going to be able to see in the same lighting conditions as the, the camera I showed you downstairs with a 92 degree field of view. Now this is $109. So what's more important? Is 550 lines of resolution more important than the lux rating? Or is having lower resolution but also being able to see in a darkened condition more important for you. Then you can come down. Then here we have 600 lines resolution with 0 .003 lux. That's $129. Then you have day, night, indoor, outdoor, 550 for 189 blah, 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 blah. So I just want to show you here, this is simply the bullet cameras, and there's just a foolish amount of, of options here. I mean, like, look at all. Like... Yeah, so just make sure that you purchase the correct camera for whatever it is that you want to be doing. If you need higher resolution, try to get 600 lines of resolution. If you need, you know, lower lux, go for the lower lux. Just make sure that you buy the camera that you're going to need. If you click on the thing you can go in and then you can see some of the mother more information there like the weather rating all this kind of stuff here we can see the amperage and the volts so this is 130 milliamps uh, with 12 volts again this is simply paint by numbers if you have to buy a power supply make sure the power supply equals this that is one thing when you go to buy these cameras sometimes they come with power supplies and sometimes they don't it might cost you an extra fifteen dollars just for a power supply so with this one uh, it looks like you have to pay ten dollars uh, for for an extra power supply but that's the only thing that I wanted to show you on the web is when you go to buy these cameras there's just a bazillion different options you can like I say you can buy bullet cameras you can buy dome cameras you can buy infrared cameras um, you know different types of housing different lux ratings different resolutions the big thing just make sure you know what you want to buy and make sure you buy the right thing. Now that, that's, that, that's about all it comes down to. And again, supercircuits.com is a very good just one-stop shop for this. It's kind of like with Newegg uh, for buying computer parts and Amazon for buying books. You might be able to find better vendors. And if you start doing a lot of sur uh, digital surveillance installations, you may want to find a better vendor. But when you're playing with it, when you're going to just install this in your little business to see how it works, just do super circuits. If you're going to do three or four installations a year, do super circuits. If you're going to do 10 installations a year, you know, super circuits is probably the, the way to go. If you're going to be doing more than 10 installations a year, then there are a lot of different distributors out there. The best thing to do is find a distributor that's that's you know works with you best you know maybe they'll get, give you financing maybe they're close to you etc but like I say unless you're doing more than than 10 installations a year I would just say use super circuits and uh, and that's it so that was a class on digital surveillance cameras uh, so we talked about the basic types of cameras that you are going to be dealing with with surveillance system installs the cameras that I showed you today are the cameras the you know they were the final cameras left that I had in inventory once I stopped uh, installing digital surveillance systems these are essentially the cameras you're going to use uh, you, you may find you know one particular vendor you like you may find one particular model you like but they will they will all basically be the types of cameras that I showed you today I showed you the form factors of the cameras again we have bullet which are basically cigar or log shaped cameras very easy to install amazingly easy to install uh, very easy to aim but if somebody comes in and you know hits them they go swinging out of the way and now they're they're recording you know the, the potato chip bags or something showed you the dome cameras the dome cameras are very nice because it's harder to mess with them it's harder to uh, to, to move them or tamper with them but on the other hand they are a little more complicated to install a little more tedious to install showed you the vandal proof uh, cameras again these are cameras you can sit there and you can hit them with a baseball bat and you will not damage a camera again the issue is if you don't mount it properly the camera won't be damaged as it goes flying into the next field again you know the, the big thing with a camera is, is not that it's recording it's not that it has a good quality picture 
it's that it's recording a good quality picture of what you need recorded. If your camera is videotaping potato chip bags or it's videotaping a squirrel out in the field, it doesn't ha help you if you're getting robbed. Then the final form factor of a camera, again, is the box camera. Box cameras are the ones that you're probably used to seeing. These can be very useful because they are very versatile. Um, you know, you can buy one type of box camera and then add all kinds of functionality as you see fit. The issue is you have to add all that functionality. So you pay 100 or 150 bucks for the box camera. Then you have to buy the specific lens you want to use. Then you have to buy the mount you want to use. If you want to put it outside or into an industrial environment, you then have to put it into a housing. Each additional feature for the box camera you have to buy and install and etc. I hate box cameras. They're almost as bad as PTZ cameras. I will never install box cameras again unless, unless I really have to. So, but that is uh, box cameras. Then you come to the PTZ cameras, pan, tilt, zoom. These are basically just the robotic cameras. Sometimes they're big, sometimes they're as small as the one I showed you. Remember, PTZ refers to the functionality. P is pan, tilt is up or down, Z is zoom in or out. You can have pan cameras. You can have tilt cameras. You can have zoom cameras. You can have pan tilt cameras. You can have just zoom cameras. So if you go to buy a PTZ camera, make sure it does all the functions you want. I personally hate analog PTZ cameras with an absolute passion. They're just like pain, 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 pain in the butt to install. If you're going to start installing analog PTZ cameras, find one PTZ camera that you really, really like and install that one. The reason is, is because they have all kinds of arcane configurations and if you don't get it right, it simply does not work. Like literally, there's little dip switches and wiring. It's just horrible. If you have an IP PTZ camera, it's a whole different world. You plug it into the, 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 the network connection and then you configure it just like a, a network appliance. Um, we talked about the difference between the analog and the IP cameras. So the, the low light camera I showed you, the infrared camera I showed you, the, P, the, uh, the vandal proof dome camera, that can be an analog camera or an IP camera. The difference between analog and IP is the stuff, more like the circuitry uh, in the camera. So you have the camera which stays the same, but there's a circuitry and how it transmits the video back to the server that is different. So with an analog camera, it just, it just transmits a, a standard analog uh, video feed that you can plug just a normal TV into. If you use an IP camera, then it transmits the video using the TCP IP protocol over an Ethernet connection. When you're talking about analog uh, cameras or IP cameras, if you're talking about analog cam cameras, it sends the video back to a DVR, a digital video recorder. If you're using IP cameras, it sends the information back to an NVR, a network video recorder. Doesn't seem like there's a whole bunch of difference, but it is, you know, it's, it's semantics, it, it is uh, uh, verbs. Um, when you're talking about analog cameras and you're talking about resolution, you're talking about TVL, TV lines, horizontal lines on the old CRT, those big uh, TVs we used to have. The highest quality analog camera is a 600 TVL camera, which is about the quality of DVD. Again, DVD seems great until you use it in a security setting and then you find out how horrible it is. IP cameras, you measure the resolution in pixels. My little five megapixel camera actually records in full 1080p high definition, so, so the same quality that you may be seeing this video in. Um, the issue with the IP cameras that you have to remember is you can get much better quality. You can get 13 megapixel cameras, 20 megapixel cameras, etc. But not all IP cameras are megapixel cameras. You can buy a $100 IP camera that has really crappy video quality. So just be careful of this when you're selling it to your client. Your client may think all IP cameras are megapixel cameras. That is not true. Make sure you buy the, the, the correct camera uh, for what you need. We talked about the cabling and the configuration for analog cameras. So we use RG59 cable to connect uh, analog cameras back to DVRs. What makes RG59 cable special? It's called Siamese cable because it has a coax cable and the power cables kind of bound in one sheath. So you have a normal coax cable and you have normal uh, positive negative 12 volt cable and they're connected in one sheath. So you can just rip it off, 
You know, one part goes to the camera, one part goes to the power. It makes life a lot easier. I also showed you how surveillance systems use BNC, British Naval Connectors, to connect everything together. Again, why do they use BNC? Who knows? There's like five different versions for connecting stuff together. Uh, connectors for connecting stuff together, they went for BNC. If you need to connect BNC into an RCA TV, you can just get a BNC to RCA connector for a buck twenty-five at uh, Radio Shack, and then you can you can connect your your, your camera into a TV or, or, or whatever else you need. Um, we talked about uh, the different types of lighting for cameras. Again, low lux cameras means a camera can see in low lighting conditions. Again, as I showed you, it can still see color uh, in just very low light. No light cameras use infrared lights, so as soon as uh, the light in your room goes below a certain level, it turns on the infrared lights, and basically it's, it's, it's like turning on a, on a floodlight for the camera. It can see in the infrared spectrum. This can be very good because it can see in your basement or in, in you know, completely dark conditions. The only issue is if a face is too close to those, those infrared lights, everything bleeds out and you can't really see any detail. You can see the blob stealing your cash register. Uh, then we talked about the auto iris. Auto iris is used when lighting conditions change. Auto iris is used for if things get too bright. If a light in a room gets too bright, it will close the iris on the lens so that it takes in less light and it can still see more detail. Again, this is an important thing, especially in places like convenience stores where they have a lot of windows. They have a lot of those floor to ceiling windows. At some time during the day, the light is probably going to be shining in one of those windows. And if you don't have auto iris, the camera is just going to get all that light flooded into it. It's not going to be able to see anything worth a darn. By having the auto iris, it'll be able to close the iris, less light comes in, and now it'll still be able to view everything. Um, okay. Then uh, finally, I, you know, I took you on the web, um, and on the on the web, I showed you how to uh, how to look at the specifications for buying cameras. It's pretty simple. I say there's a billion different types of cameras out there. You have to find a vendor you like, a manufacturer you like, you have to see what specifications the camera has and what specifications you have, and, um, and that's, that, that's really all there is to it. The one thing I do realize I forgot to say during the class is you will hear of very focal lenses versus fixed lenses. What that means is when you're dealing with something like a dome camera like this, most dome cameras have what are called fixed lenses. What I was talking about before, where basically it's focused on whatever it's focused on. It has a, a specific viewing range, and that's all that we'll ever see. So you'll see it'll it'll say like a 45 degree viewing range, which means it can it can see in a in, in a 45 uh, degree angle. Very focal lenses means you can change the focus of the lens. So it really depends on what setting environment you need, whether you want to use fixed lenses or very focal lenses. Generally, I always use fixed lenses because with fixed lenses, they're always fixed at the same focus point, so you don't have to worry about the camera going out of focus. But if you want to buy a thousand cameras and have them in stock, and you never really know what setting you're going to be dealing with, you may want to buy cameras with very focal lenses because then you can change you know, how much or how little the camera sees. So whenever you're talking about focus, you're always talking about viewing angle. So let's say a 90 degree viewing angle means it can see in a 90 degree arc out like that. 180 means it has basically perfect peripheral vision. They have 360 degree cameras that can actually see in every single direction. Or you can get much smaller. You may have like a 25 degree uh, lens where it focuses in on one specific thing. So if you want a, a camera that only focuses on the till of a cash register, you may have that camera with a very focused lens. You have to decide what you're going to use. But that is one thing I forgot to say in the rest of this. That's the difference between fixed lenses and very focal lenses. But that is the overall class on digital surveillance cameras. We talked a lot about the analog cameras in this class. We're going to have another class where we talk more about IP cameras specifically. The big thing to remember is that analog cameras and IP cameras, you know, are basically the same in a lot of ways. 
IP cameras will just have some more functionality that we'll talk about later. So you can have IP cameras with, with the infrared lights, you can have IP cameras with auto iris, you can have IP cameras with low lux, uh, etc. So IP cameras will have the same functionality, the same form factors, etc. Um, it will just have some more stuff and they get more complicated. So that was a class on digital surveillance uh, cameras. Again, this was a follow-up. This is a continuing class from Introduction to uh, Digital Surveillance Systems. And we will have a few more classes in this track. Again, digital surveillance systems in general are not overly complicated. You know, all the classes that I'm going to have in this track will show you how to install and maintain these systems. Um, this is a very, very good business to get into. It is a very high profit margin with very low technical skill. Uh, the average person can figure out most of this stuff. If you know anything about small office networking, TCP IP networking, you should be able to pick this up like a, a snap and, and have no issues whatsoever. Um, this is one of the nice fields in technology where it's, it's pretty, pretty enclosed. You know, you don't have to worry about a lot of fancy stuff. Um, everything, as long as you buy good quality equipment, Everything basically works as long as you as you do your specifications correctly, as long as you do your expectations management correctly with the client, as long as basically you plan the project correctly, everything goes pretty easy. You make a lot of money really quickly and you don't have to be a rocket scientist to do it. So, uh, so you know, that, that's one of the things I like about digital surveillance systems. So again, this was digital surveillance cameras on the digital surveillance system track. I am Eli the Computer Guy over here for elithecomputerguy.com and everymanit.com. I enjoyed teaching this class and I look forward to seeing you at the next one.